Yeah, I'm happy that uh, there still are some people interested in, in this subject. It's uh, it's a very, to many people, very obscure subject, since it's not an area where a lot of security research has happened, well, during the last 20 years, ever since GSM has been deployed. Um, and it is about time to change that. That's what Osmo PV is about. So, um, I'm going to go through those slides quickly, because we have 40 minutes and most people don't know the first thing about GSM network, so we have to get some basics and, and, and try to move on um, quickly into actually the tool and, and do some demonstration. Um, well, the slide about myself, I'm going to skip that just so much. I'm doing electrical engineering as well as software development, and my focus has been communication protocol security for about 15 years. Um, yeah, if you look at GSM and 3G protocol level security, then and you compare it with TCP IP slash internet security that most people in this room are familiar with, then there's a couple of observations uh, that I have to make. First of all, the protocol specifications are as open and as uh, disclosed as they are for TCP IP. So if you want to learn about TCP IP, you go ahead, you read the RFCs. If you want to learn about GSM, you go to the Etsy or the 3 gpp website, you download the specifications, you read them. There's nothing secret about that. Um, on the one hand, we see the internet protocol stack. By that, I mean TCP IP, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and so on. We see a lot of scrutiny, a lot of hacking going on, lots of security research. Um, but then, um, well, if you compare that with GSM networks, which are as widely deployed as uh, 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 TCP IP-based networks, there's nothing of that happening in GSM networks. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One of them is, the industry is extremely closed and closed-minded, and I'm going to uh, talk about why that is and how that is. Um, there are only about four closed proprietary protocol stack implementations that everyone uses and that uh, nobody really gets access to. Um, and the chipset makers that produce the radio chipsets uh, never really release any hardware documentation, um, even to their own customers. Uh, the, the amount of documentation they release is, is very limited. Now, a little bit about the GSM industry. If you look at the handset manufacturing side, this is uh, telephone makers, then the chipsets used for the baseband processor, for the actual radio side, and there are only very few companies that do that today. You can probably come up with five or six, and that's it. Um, there used to be many more. Um, the companies, uh, they, they don't write their own operating system on those baseband processes. So they license a proprietary real-time operating system from a third party, and quite often they also license or have licensed a proprietary protocol stack from a protocol stack vendor. So the chipset maker doesn't even understand the software that runs on his chipset. And then the handset maker, the custom of the chipset maker, um, there are only very few, company who, very few companies that can actually buy those baseband chipsets from the chipset makers because it's not an open market. You cannot just go there and say, hey, I want to buy you know, 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 of your chips. It's not working that way, right? Only if you can prove that you will buy millions of chips per year to them, and you put a large NRE on the table, then they will actually start to talk to you and consider you becoming a customer of them. And um, even those people who have managed to become customers of the chipset makers, um, they don't get the full documentation, and particularly they don't get access to the entire source code. So now you're a handset manufacturer, but the protocol stack is just this blob you put somewhere, and you know, it works, and, and nobody really knows why and how and what it does, and nobody cares. So the handset manufacturer, uh, sorry, the, this was the handset side. Now if you talk, talk about the network equipment side, the cell towers, the core network components, and so on, well, there's Ericsson, Nokia, Siemens networks, Alpha, Toulouse, and Huawei, and that's it. There are no other big manufacturers left of, of using network equipment. Um, if you ignore central cell manufacturers and such. So only operators are customers of those um, manufacturers, and since it's professional telco grade equipment, the quantities are low, the prices are high. If you want to buy such a system, even the smallest unit in such a system, and st uh, start to run your own network to do security research on GSM protocols, well, you have to have a lot of money. The BTS alone, which is the smallest element in the network, uh, something that operators buy today is in the range of 10 to 40,000 euros per unit. And if you want to have an entire network, then you have to spend at least a six digit, if not seven digit figure um, uh, to get a, a basic minimal operational network. And that, of course, means that 
only people who work for operators or for uh, equipment manufacturers or for telephone manufacturers or rather baseband chipset manufacturers have access to the technology at a level where they can send uh, arbitrary protocol frames, right? Which is something that, you know, it's, it's the Ethernet card type of access to the protocol. You can send an arbitrary frame. You can use flags that are not meant to be used that way. You can send wrong length fields in the encoding. That kind of access just didn't exist in the GSM industry before um, uh, projects like Osmo Um The operators themselves, there may be banks, don't think of an operator as a technology company. That's a wrong perception. The typical operators today, they outsource their billing, they outsource their network planning, their network servicing, and their network deployment. There's nothing really technical left in the operator. Um, the operator, they, also the staff they have is, well, they buy some equipment from, from Ericsson, and they get some training for their staff from Ericsson, and well, then they know how to configure it. But actual knowledge about the detailed, um, detailed inner workings of the protocols, uh, you will find very, very few people at operators, particularly not at small operators, who have that kind of knowledge. And if you go to operators and talk to them, they will tell you, well, you know, 10 years ago we still had staff that had that knowledge, but you know, today these people are very senior, they're expensive, there are only few of them on the planet. Uh, we couldn't afford to pay them anymore, we just laid them off. Right? So today we don't have those people anymore. We just buy the equipment and you know, the equipment manufacturer tells us it works. That's sort of the level um, here. Now security implications of this is, well, you have very few people who have detailed knowledge about how those protocols work outside the network equipment manufacturers or the protocol stack manufacturers for the handset side, which is I don't know, maybe a couple of hundred people on this planet, I don't think it's, it's, it's really a larger, a larger number that, that understands those protocols. That results in no independent research on protocol level security, which means, well, um, you find some academic people who do cryptographic research on, on particular ciphers that are used in the system, but yeah, that's just one particular aspect of the system, and it's not really the, the protocol level as such. And you find people doing application level research like mobile malware, which is 10 layers up the stack from what I'm talking about. Um, and 10 is not an exaggeration. So, um, or you, yeah, the application layer stuff I, I personally find very boring because, well, as I said, I mean, it's, it's so far up the stack, um, you can do much more things on the lower layers, much more easy things. Um, and we have no open source protocol implementations, uh, which I believe are key to make people understand about it, right? If, if you are a student and you get some specification or some textbooks, that's one part. But if you have an open source implementation which you can play with, where you can just modify bits and pieces here and there, and where you can, can uh, send arbitrary data, that kind of stuff, um, and you can have you have your own ideas. You modify the stack. Um, then uh, that's how how people do pr prototyping. That's how people innovate. And if you don't work for that industry, you, you just have no chance to do that in GSM. Now, if you want to get started, there's two ways how you can start um, to look at this. Right? You can try to build a network side equipment which enables you to send arbitrary data to telephones and then try to you know, do buffer overflows in telephones, protocol fuzzing, and, and try to do exploits based on that. Or you can do it from the handset side and try to attack the network from the handset. And uh, if you want to run the network side, um, it's relatively difficult because the equipment, the, the GSM network equipment is, is expensive and, and not easily available. Um, however, the actual network architecture is very modular. So if you can buy one of the elements, only the transceiver station, then you can implement all the other parts of the network if you have the time to do so, because the interfaces between the individual components are standardized and have standardized protocols. So you don't need to uh, buy all the components, you only need one that the component generates the radio interface and everything else you can write if you have the skill and time. Um, so this has been done in the years 2008 and 2009 with a project called OpenBSC, which a couple of friends and I did. There's another project called OpenBGS, which has a technically very different approach, but which you can also use to generate a GSM uh, network-side interface, and that can be used to pass handsets. Um, there are some people doing research on this, and uh, just at the Hack.eu conference, a lot of Philip Weinmann has presented on his success of um, owning and actually exploiting the baseband processes of about every major chipset manufacturer. 
to move the instruction pointer in the radio processor of an iPhone takes four messages on the air interface. That's it. You send four handcrafted messages and then you own the processor name. And this is the processor that controls the radio interface, that controls the microphone, that controls the entire uh, phone part of the telephone. And nobody really seems to be looking at it apart from maybe a couple of weird guys. Um, on the handset side, it's difficult because, as I said, the chipset uh, is not documented, the protocol stacks are closed source. Um, the, the interface on the handset is, well, it's a dial pad. You don't get lower level access interface to the protocol stack on those devices. Um, and even if you happen to have sufficient time to write your own stack based on the specification, um, how do you run it on hardware that's not documented? How do you write drivers for, for undocumented hardware? Um, there have been two attempts to do this in the past. One of them is called the TSN30 project, named after a phone that was sold, I don't think, well, maybe eight years ago in Spain. Um, the other one's called Mad OS, which was an alternative operating system for older um, Nokia handsets. Uh, both of them have not succeeded um, and have been abandoned quite a number of years ago. So the bootstrapping process goes a bit like this. You start to read specification, you gotta be very knowledge about the protocols, you obtain some actual, you know, network equipment. There are mobile station test sets. You can buy some BTSs on eBay. You try to get protocol traces and start to write a protocol stack. After you've done that, you can finally play with the protocol stack and do security analysis. So all the steps up to the second, uh, up to the last one on this slide, have now all been done. So you can enter at, at the finally part, right? This is the security community now has the tools to do all the things that people always wanted to do in GSM networks but not, never were able to do. Now, um, this is the GSM interface. Um, what we're talking about is the air interface over here, the UM interface, the radio interface. Um, that's the handset, that's the, the BTS, which is called, uh, people say, cell tower. It connects over an ABUS protocol to a base station control, a mobile switching center, you have all kinds of components in the core network. Um, the protocols on each of those interfaces is very different. The protocol stack is different, the encoding is different, there are different layers, uh, different depth of layers. It's not like a TCP IP network where you have a stupid network that just has routers and intelligent end nodes. But actually, these protocols, a lot of them terminate at some of those units and completely different protocols are used somewhere else with different protocol stack. The nice thing is though, from the handset, messages you send on layer 3, they either terminate at the BTS. Oh, well, actually, they, they, only layer 2 terminates at the BTS. Layer 3 goes either to the base station controller, which can control over up to 255 cell towers. So if you, if you can manage to knock out the base station controller, then you knock out the entire neighborhood. And if you go up the, all the other layer 3 messages, they terminate at the mobile switching center. And if you manage to do something evil to the mobile switching center, you knock out at least an entire city. Right? So this is um, this a, a transparent channel from the radio interface on layer 3 to different elements relatively far up in the network that uh, um, people well, have the option of doing things with. I'm going to skip that slide if you want to read up on it later. Um, yeah. So the protocol stack on the air interface that uh, is implemented in Osmo Com DB um, and in any other mind handset, of course. You have a radio layer, you have a, a LAP DM um, uh, uh, layer 2, that's a sort of an HDLC type uh, layer 2 protocol. Layer 3 you have, um, it doesn't really have a name, it's just a 0408, that's a specification number layer. You have radio resource mobility management call control layer, and on top of that you start to have things like USSD, SMS and other things that the network offers you. The interesting thing from a security point of view, from my fault, is you can do denial of service at those layers, but actually trying to, to play with encoding, supply to, uh, try to compromise protocol parses and so on, all happens in layer three and above. In layer three, you have variable length encodings, you have TLD parsers and that kind of stuff. So, um, there are a couple of things that people know about GSM networks if they've ever remotely looked at the problem. There's no mutual authentication between phone and network, which means every phone will just believe anyone who claims to be Swisscom or AT&T. Oh yes, hi Swisscom, hi AT&T. False base station attacks, you can do them all the time if you manage to create a network site. Um, uh, air interface. We have encryption algorithms, the encryption is optional. Um, the user doesn't know whether encryption is actually enabled or not. Authentication is even optional, but well, the operator typically wants to know who you, who you are, so encryption is, is much more widely used. 
Um, you can do denial of service, um, and there are protocols that are, well, not security in the sense of you can exploit uh, stability of systems, but privacy problems. Anyone who can provide a network side interface, which is not authenticated, can use the radio resource location protocol to obtain the GPS fix of the handset. So a non-authenticated network can just say, hey, I'm, I'm the network, please give me your GPS coordinates. The telephone will say, ah, yeah, sure, there it is. Um, there's no authentication at this point, right? And this, is, this has been in the specification for years and years, and nobody really looks at it, and nobody really experiments with it um, for, for uh, that much time. Now, if we look at the baseband processor on which uh, Osmo Pump BB runs, what is this? The baseband processor is an ARM7 or an ARM9 core, um, runs some real-time operating system. Um, it often has no memory protection between tasks. Well, not surprising on an ARM7 there is no memory management unit. How would you have any memory protection? Um, you have a DSP that runs some signal processing software um, at the lower level of, of, of the layer one. Um, and the software stack on this entire system is written in C and assembly. It lacks any modern security features. There's no stack protection, no non-executable pages, no address space randomization, nothing. Means if you manage to exploit that piece, you, you can go anywhere, you completely own the system. Um, the complexity of the stack, the attack surface we're talking about is about 2.5 million lines of C code. Right? That's the complexity that runs here without any modern security features. The chipset itself looks a bit like this, um, and this is one particular example from Texas Instruments. Um, about any GSM baseband chipset and a GSM phone looks like this. 3G looks slightly different. Not going to go into the details here. If you want to read up more, I've written a paper on this subject. It's linked from the slide. You can check that out. Um, just, well, we have the digital baseband processor over here. This contains the ARM7. This contains the DSP. We have an analog baseband here an RF transceiver, an RF power amplifier, and antenna switch. Now, if we want to run our own software to, to fully control that system, which what Osmo Pong BB is about, we need to have drivers to drive all these analog and digital peripherals, and of course the actual protocol stack that runs on the ARM set. Um, yeah, so we need the chipset under our control, layer one, layer two, layer three implementations, none of those components existed. So in January this year I decided we need to start to we need to start to create them. Um, what can we do now? Um, we can either build this entire baseband well sort of chipset ourselves then from, from standard components, which means we don't need to do reverse engineering of the hardware, we don't need leaked information or that kind of stuff. But if we do our custom hardware design, it takes a long time, it needs debugging, it needs hardware prototyping, it takes a lot of time. The other option is we use an existing baseband chipset, which is not publicly documented, of course, um, but still do our own board design. This, we know the schematics, we know how the chips are hooked up to each other, um, but still in the end it will be custom hardware, low quality, doesn't really make a lot of sense. The lazy approach that we chose was to repurpose existing mobile phones really simple old phones like this one, which is a Motorola C123. Um, this is a phone you can buy today on eBay for 15 euros. Um, and um, if we use existing phones, we know the hardware design is working, we know the specific hardware unit is working because the original phone firmware from the manufacturer runs on this hardware. We don't need to do hardware prototyping, however, we need to do reverse engineering, we need to buy drivers and so on. But in the end, it allows us to focus on doing the actual job implementing the protocol stack and, and enabling uh, security research on a protocol level. We started to search for some phones. The most interesting chipset we found was the TI Calypso. I've mentioned this before. Uh, because the digital baseband processor register set is on crypto for whatever reason, the analog baseband documentation you can find on Chinese developer website, um, proprietary GSM stack source code was on sourceforge.net for four years, 1,600 downloads before TI finally took it down. So there was a lot of existing information for this. Um, it does not have any cryptography oh. checks in the bootloader, so no known DRM cracking required in order to download your own code into the basement processor. Um, so we chose the TI Calypso. It was started January this year. We started implement those layers, the, the drivers oh. and so on. The name of the project, by the way, is Open Source Mobile Communications Basement. That's Cosmo.com, BB. 
So, software architecture. Um, since the people who work on Osmo BB are the same people who work on OpenBSC, which is a network-side protocol stack implementation, we try to reuse a lot of code. Um, and we run as little as possible of the software in the phone, because debugging software on the PC is much easier native than cross-compiling, cross-debugging, and, and all that stuff. So what we run on the phone is only the layer one, and then we implement uh, an interface over, over a serial wire from the phone to the PC, um, and then we run layer two, layer three, the actual application software and so on on the PC, which enables us, well, that gives us more flexibility. This interface between layer one on the phone and layer two on the PC is called layer one control. It's implemented as a messaging uh, protocol over, over an HDLC type uh, protocol. Um, we have some other interfaces, I'm going to skip that. We want to see something in the demo shortly. Now, um, the Osmo PB consists of several parts. One of them it is the actual firmware you write into the target, which runs on the ARM7 in this device. Um, the other part is host software. The firmware includes drivers for the digital baseband, analog baseband, RF transceiver for the display, the LCD display, the NOR flash. It contains the actual GSM layer 1 and the serial communications layer. The total size of this firmware, as I said, 100% written from scratch, no operating system involved, nothing. We don't re reuse existing code in the flash of the phone. Um, you can do that in, in what, right now I think we have, we have about 60 kilobytes of object code that still includes debugging. So this is really not all that much code that needed to be written. Um, on the host software, um, on the PC, we have a program or a set of programs called Layer 23 because it implements Layer 2 and Layer 3 of the protocol, and 23 is a good number. So, um, it drives this Layer 1 control API over the serial line. Um, it includes the Layer 2, Layer 3 protocol stacks, things like cell selection, SIM card emulation. You can also access the real SIM card in the phone, of course, which you need in order to authenticate against real networks. And it supports apps, which, well, so the idea is this entire protocol stack can be used by multiple applications. One application just behaves like a normal phone. You know, it will scan, it will register, you can make phone calls, all the boring stuff. And then there are some other programs that allow you to do more, uh, let's say, passive uh, scanning uh, protocol analysis. All the communication that we send between the phone and the host PC on this uh, layer one control interface it's dumped as an IP multicast packet out of the, the host software, and we have written Wireshark code, which is already in Wireshark mainline right now, so you can see all the all the, the GSM protocol decoded in Wireshark that goes between the, the, the radio interface and your phone. Um, okay, the hardware that we support is a set of Motorola phones, you know, C100 something, 120 something, and so on. It's a wide range of model. The two most popular devices with the developers are the C123 and C155. These are SSF phones built until 2008, about 15 euros now. They are available for all the GSM bands, so whether you're in the US or in Europe, you will always find the, the matching Motorola phone for, for running the software. This is the board, if you look at the actual hardware um, that the software runs on. This is inside the phone, removing the shielding covers and so on. Once again, you see the digital baseband processor, analog baseband processor, RF transceiver, crystal oscillator, RF power amplifier, antenna switch, RAM, NOR flash, and so on, the, the, the components. What you will not see is a serial connector on this device. The funny thing is, you have the headset connector, that's your earphone connector. And into the earphone connector, you plug a cable that looks like this. It has a USB plug on the one hand side, and has a, a 2.5 millimeter jack on the other side. And this phone overlays the analog audio pins with a serial line. So you can actually inject code through the earphone plug of that device. <laughs> which I think is uh, nice to some extent. So, what's working? Well, basically everything is working uh, that you need for, for exchanging messages with the base station controller, mobile switching center, and such. Um, what we don't do, well, we, these are all details, technical details, and we'll skip them. Um, we don't do half ray channels for people who care about that. Um, we don't do circuit switch data. We don't do GPRS, because GPRS is, is much more complex than the old GSM. Um, maybe at some point, but not right now. So, um, if you use that software, I'm going to do a dem demo shortly. Um, the, the, well, yeah, this is this was not working. Um, if you use that software, anything you need for security analysis is finished. I mean, as I said, you can make voice calls, you can establish signaling channels, you can establish data channels, you can 
you can talk to various components in the network. Well, we of course don't have type approval for this, um, but yeah, who cares? Um, so, um, I'm going to go into the demo now. There's just some, some summary slides now. Um, and uh, I think the demo is much more exciting, so you can check out the slides um, online. Now, where are we? Here. Okay. I'm going to restart this. Sorry for the small font. I'm going to use a bigger font soon, just to, to show you something uh, uh, in parallel to Windows now. So on the left-hand side, I'm starting a program called OsmoCon, the open source mobile console program, um, with a couple of parameters. I tell it which firmware image to load into the telephone. And on the right-hand side, I'm starting the mobile application. The mobile application is an application implementing a mobile phone that runs on the PC. So left-hand side is a console program, right-hand side is the actual telephone program. Um, now, I have connected this phone. This phone is stock. It contains the original vendor firmware. This is like we would, we would get it out of packaging. You plug in this cable. The cable you can also buy Finnish manufactured. You don't need to solder your own cable or anything. And you press the power on button on this phone, and the phone will start downloading code over the earphone jacket. This is the original bootloader of the phone, asking for code to be sent into the serial socket. Now, what you will see here, is on the left hand side is serial debug output from our layer 1 code on the ARM7. It tells us it's scanning the frequency band, it gives us receive levels and so on. On the right hand side we see the layer 2 and layer 3 stack doing the cell reselection process. It's, it, it is doing a power scan, it's selecting all the different cells that it can receive, it's obtaining what's called system information messages from the individual cells, it's aggregating them, and when it's finished, it will present us with a list of all the GSM cells that are uh, receivable to the phone in this building, in this very location. This is what every normal phone would do um, when you switch it on a cold start your phone. Right? It scans the spectrum, it tries to find out which cells are available and so on. But the difference here really is that all of this, the, down to the last line of, of code that drives this protocol stack, is source code and you can tweak and, and modify it according to what you want. Um, going to wait until it's finished here, you, on the, you can again see debugging output, you, you see what's happening, you see a frequency correction happening, frequency control loops running, um, you see you know, layer 1 is being reset, you see the channels and, and, and all kinds of details. Um, the interesting part is what happens when this process is finished, you will get this nice cell list. Um, here you see it's receiving stuff that has bit errors, of course, if a cell is very bad reception, you will have bit errors and, and uh, can, can't correct them anymore. Um, so, should be finished any, any second now. There we go. So, we have two lists of cells here. This is our actual cell list. It tells you, well, this is the RFCAN, this is the channel number for in, in GSM. This is the mobile country code, all of them are 228, which is Switzerland. This is the network code, 01 is Swisscom, 02 is Orange, I think, 03 is Sunrise, no, 02 is Sunrise, 03 is Orange. And then we will also see 06, which is the Swiss uh, Schweizer Bundesbahn, the Swiss uh, uh, um, railway company, because a lot of the rail management and the actual control of, of rail uh, trains is done over GSM in Europe. Right, this is the GSM railway network, something your normal phone would never show you, but the hardware can receive it and can talk to those networks. It's just hiding it from you from using it. Here um, you can see the receive level of those cells and, and some other parameters. If you go further, you see, well, this is the actual number of networks it has received. Surprisingly, it did not see, we have our own network running here at the conference, and surprisingly, this was not, um, was not this big is uh, sort of a surprise to me, as the network is down or, or something else is happening. So what I'm going to show now is um, a bigger font terminal. Channel local host 4247, yeah. It's a Cisco style talent interface of the mobile application that runs on the PC. So I can do things like this, right? And I see, ah, okay, there's stuff I can, I can see. So I can do something like, uh, um, whatever, show cell 1. This is again the cell list that we have seen. I can do things like enable, and I can do things like network uh, search 1. And then we'll start again to search the network. If I switch back to this screen, you see the beginning of the process like we started it again. 
so this has been triggered now from this talent console. And like I'm searching for networks now, of course I can also um, then once once the network scan has finished, I can also say network select and then it tries to, to select this network, it performs a location area update, establishes a radio channel and so on. So um, this is sort of the user interface we have, the Cisco style interface, and of course you can you can arbitrarily say which GMC to use, which INEI to use, you know, it's it's all up to you what kind of identifiers to use, what kind of power to transmit at. It's up to you to jitter the timing to obscure your location from the cell. It's, there's so many things you can do. Um, it, it's uh, yeah, it's all there. Um, up to up to everyone, to, up to anyone to, to have fun with uh, GSM networks. This is really the equivalent of an Ethernet card in Ethernet networks, where all the protocol stack runs on a PC, and now finally, um, 20 years after GSM has been deployed, is uh, is available. Um, yeah, this could have, could have been done by people much earlier, it's just that nobody did it. Um, and uh, yeah, well, now it's there. So uh, we have some time for questions. Um, I'm, I'm just going to let this run once it's finished. I'm going to show something again, but meanwhile we can take up some questions. So, questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone, by the way, if you have questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a question back there. Uh, just wait for the microphone. Ah, yeah. oh, there we are. Uh, our scan has completed. And I'm, I'm going to your question just in a minute, but here now we have found the 42 network, which is the one that we run here. Okay, so, question. Okay, uh, will you please do uh, set the device in order to. Can you make a phone call now or on, on the Swisscom or on that? I could make a phone call on the Swisscom network, but I'm not authorized to do that. That's why I'm not going to demonstrate it, right? Um, there's nothing technically that is missing from this implementation, but, you know, in Germany, I would dare to do it because I know the legal situation there. In the European Union, there's sort of a regulatory gap for modifying software of radios after they have been shipped, and it's not really clear that anyone is liable for what happens. But, um, in Switzerland, <laughs> honestly, I don't have any idea, and I'm not going to play with official uh, um, uh, uh, Swisscom or other networks. What I was trying to demonstrate, we will be using our own network, right? We're running our own network here at Hashdays um, using OpenBSC, and of course we can talk from our telephone to that network. But there's nothing that prevents this software to talk to real operator networks. It has been done, people have done like 30 minutes voice calls on, on uh, uh, Vodafone in Germany using the software, right? So we, 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 we just use the, the SIM cards and we do the authentication using the SIM card. We get the key material from the SIM card and um, establish encrypted authenticated con con uh, connections. It's nothing the operator will notice that there's any difference unless you start sending, you know, platform packets or something. Okay, another question? What's the legality of sending platform packets on that? I mean, is this... So, for instance, what I'm saying is... That I, I guess I guess where I'm going with this is that uh, the legality of sending platform packets on the internet is, I mean, despite the fact that this is also carried by your cellular provider. I, I mean, giving it the same company. I, I, well, and so that's not actually illegal for me to spout packets down whatever tubes I pay for. Um, however, <laughs> um, I'm technically paying for a connection to my cellular provider, right? Like, well, um, the kind of packets, you, there's a couple of aspects to this. The kind of packets you send, they, I mean, what you get in the first hand is a signaling channel. You're not paying for the signaling channel. You're paying for actual data, like traffic channels voice conversation or a, a modem connection over GSM or GPRS data services, the content you could do. But the signaling that your phone does all register, you know, the, the kind of signaling that your phone exchanges with the switch is nothing that you pay for. But, I mean, that, I don't think that this matters. What matters is, though, that, I mean, if you have to look at the laws of the, of the specific countries. In Germany, for example, disrupting uh, a public telecommunications network doesn't say GSM, doesn't say internet. Disrupting a public uh, communications network is subject a criminal offense subject to up to five years imprisonment. Right? That's disrupting a public uh, uh, communications network. 
right? There are other offenses that, that you might think uh, you could commit using that software in, according to German law, but fundamentally, legally, yes, I do not see a difference from, from uh, you know, uh, uh, sending packets to, to, yeah. David Burgess has a question back there. There is one more question. Okay, there was, sorry, there was, yeah, let's do the answer first. Yeah, another, another part of the answer to your question is that when these uh, core network elements like base station controllers and mobile switching centers are being built, uh, we've discovered by accident that a lot of them don't necessarily have very good internal protections. It's not from packets against overflow conditions and overload conditions. You can actually crash elements in the core network um, by you can crash elements in the core network through the interface if you have access to it. Yeah, you can you can bring down the cell phone network of a city of a large city through the layer. So I mean, I guess what I was asking is whether or not prima facie you're guilty by sending those multiple packets. So for instance, on the internet, if I send a bunch of packets out and like the router crashes somewhere down the line, right then. It's, it's a lot more difficult to show intent, whereas, for instance, if you're sending malform packets over radio, then, I mean, are you just guilty? Um, under U.S. law, like I said, I can't speak for the European Union law, but under U.S. law, I mean, I guess and this is sort of the repeat Morgan's question, what's the whole, what's the big deal about sending malform packets, who cares? Yeah, and, but, but no, under, under U.S. <laughs> law, um, under, under U.S. law, there's special consideration given for, for um, Communication channels that are not normally available to the public, and so any you know any fool can go buy an Ethernet card, you know, and hook it up and you know run crazy stuff through a DSL mode, whatever. You know, that's that's available to almost you know, anyone. It's thirty bucks for that fries. It's, it's a game. Um, but because of the way that these telecom networks have been managed traditionally, uh, anything below around layer five is simply not accessible. It's deliberately been made inaccessible. And when you've circumvented that, you've gone into the realm of, of communications not normally available to the public. At least under U.S. law, that's where you're starting to turn into trouble. And that, if you do it, if you do it with the knowledge that you are likely to disrupt public communications, you know. Yeah. Um, just before I'm, I'm going to demo the next step. Um, just let me add that, yes, what David said about, I mean, this is stuff that has been developed in the 80s and it's still used today, right? I mean, GSM protocols have been designed in the 1980s and they are used more or less unmodified until today. And nobody has thought of the fact of, uh, you know, people setting up road base stations or people sending up uh, foreign messages or anything like this, right? This was developed in the 80s for a trans-European communication system within the European uh, common market at that time. It was never used to be, uh, you know, it was European manufacturers, European operators, it was all government owned at the time and so on. So it was never, it was, you know, everybody trusts each other, nobody will do anything harmful kind of atmosphere. And um, the problem is that those, those assumptions have never been fixed over the, over the long deployment history of GSM. So today we still have the situation that as soon as you get access to those protocols, you can crash if you if you run Osmo on the phone and you can you can you can crash uh, equipment of, of of the operators. The other way around, if you run stuff like OpenBTS or OpenBSC and send out foreign messages to the handsets, they crash like that. I mean, they crash all the time. Today, without doing anything harmful, just by setting up this network, I've already crashed you know three or four phones. Um, just because accidentally, maybe I'm setting a bit wrong, and they just fall over. It's it's. Input validation does not exist in these code bases. Okay, so let me just demo something, and I think that we're sort of running out of time. Um, yeah, so now we have um, this network 42, and what I'm going to do is uh, um, just... Uh, no, logging? No, there is no logging, okay. No, okay. Um, network show... One network select one two two eight forty two. So now it's selecting the network forty two in Switzerland, which is our own network. And uh, if I can find the right window here, then yeah, this is. I, I have to scroll back. 
Oh, I hope this, this, this will stop right now and then I will scroll up and show you what it's happening. Um, yeah, I, can, I can't really hold this console unless I'm, well, let's just stop the phone and then let's go on stop. Okay, now what I'm, I'm going back. So what has happened here is that we, we start to select the network and then uh, it, uh, where are we? Here, for example, here it starts to perform location update. The location update is a request to the network where the phone says, you know, I now, I now want to register to this location area, which is sort of a geographical region of the DSM network. And uh, we send a location updating request. Um, and uh, here we see the detailed steps of the lower layers. We see a channel request. Um, that requests the channel from the base station. We send the random access bursts, which is the, the method by which you establish channels to the network. We get an immediate assignment. The, the, the network assigns a channel to us, a dedicated communication channel. And then we, uh, you know, we, we uh, receive some data on that channel. And at a certain uh, point, we, uh, for example, we get an identity request. The network asks us, what is your identity? Um, we respond with uh, you know, our identity, our MZ and, and IMEI information, and at a certain point in time, we get a location update reject from the network because we are not authorized to join this network, right? This phone has not been authorized in this network. But if I configure the network to authorize this phone, then of course I can attach to the network. And all this signaling, I mean, this signaling that we're seeing here, right, trying to register the network and so on, this is all happening on the layer three. So before the network even knows your identity, you have a transparent channel that goes all up the way to the MSC. So there's, you can even do this without a SIM card, right? Your identity is not established at the point where you start talking to those components. This is just, again, to give you an indication of what's happening. So, um, yeah. Do we, we still oh. have nine minutes of time, and here is another question. Okay. Would it be possible that it showed some uh, traces? Uh, Wireshark? No, no. Yeah, I can show Wireshark traces. Let me just, uh, I have to restart this. Uh, um, so, for example, what I can do is I can send this to 224 and 001. Um, which means uh, all the all the frames I get sent to a multicast IP address um, could be any IP address. But uh, so now I'm restarting this um, uh, process. It downloads again the code into the phone, and we start again the network uh, search. And even during this network search, we should already find a lot of um, interesting stuff. Um, now what I'm going to do is. doing what I'm not supposed to be doing. Um, I know I should set T shark set you I know, I know. Ah, okay, there again we have that problem. Um, this is not a network system, so I can afford to be exposed plus. Um, ETH zero. Yeah, so where are we? Too many windows. <laughs> okay, this is synchronized with the channels but not receiving something. Oh, now we actually receive some things. Do we see? No, we don't. That's sad. Um, ah, yeah, this might be related to my, sorry for that. Might be related to the file one over here. We should have already seen some messages. Let me just try to capture them on the loopback interface, sometimes they show up there. I should I should just send them to local host and then we we fine. There we go. Where is our wire track? Here it is. Capturing a loopback, it's still not seeing packets. Yeah, that's the demonstration. Ah no, there we go, we actually see them. Yeah, now localhost of course sends back ICMP re reject packets because we'll be sending UDP packets to localhost and localhost says, well, there's nothing is missing to here. So I'm filtering out the, the, those packets. And then we see here, paging requests, immediate assignments, system information, the packets coming from the network. Um, right, this is a net, uh, this is Sunrise 228.02, location area 7000. It tells us, you know, all kinds of parameters of the network. 
Um, here it is paging requests, the network is, is uh, asking phones to, to contact the network, just trying to find one that actually contains something, because most of them are idle, normally. There we go. So here, the network is paging a particular mobile phone with this given temporary identifier. Um, right? and we see all kinds of other messages here. Um, system information tool, which gives you uh, the neighbor, set, uh, neighbor channel list of, of a certain network and so on. So all this signaling and control information is coming down from the cells uh, you just see here. And when we try to register, I'm going to retry the registration if it has found the... Uh, many windows. Where is it? Ah, uh, here. Now it's still, still not finished with the uh, initial network scan. But once it has finished this... Um, ah, it has finished. So now we can again go to our telnet window if we find this. Um, select one two two eight forty two, and I'm going back to the Wireshark, and then we will see things like, um, well, this is still paging requests. Um, yeah, and here we already see um, messages uh, that uh, on, on a dedicated channel here, um, such as. Uh, Big surprise that it doesn't decode them properly right now. I'm not quite sure why that is. The layer 3 does not get decoded uh, for all those strings here. Seems to be some problem. Yeah. Don't really know. So, so what we see here right now, um, the channel type is STCCH net 4. This is already a signaling channel that we have uh, that has been allocated to this phone. Um, and on that signaling channel, we see frames. We only see the layer 2 header, but it doesn't decode the actual um, ah, it's because they're idle frames, okay. So this is just idle frames. Um, yeah, we see system information type 5 and 6, which is information that is sent on this dedicated channel, which once again contains things like uh, neighbor cell lists and such, which uh, we don't have in our simplistic network. We only have one, one cell and no neighbors. Um, yeah, but yeah, I... I I don't know why it is, there should be some, some more visible some more visible frames right now. But I mean, as the general proof has been made, you can see the messages as they come from the network uh, um, in real time to get them into Wireshark using this mechanism. Okay, there was one uh, well, uh, I'm talking about the next level. I mean, could you run, for example, one of these uh, commercial OSs which is running on the, like, for example, BTS, and running, for example, through Box? To get and have a loop, loop back to do all this stuff, like to, like for example, in a single host. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, well, uh, like, so we have the client, and we can, for example, inject some malicious packets. Uh, but uh, I mean, for example, on the server side, if you want to see what is actually happening, for example, you can see here, for example, the server is crashing. But if you want to see, like, for example, if a commercial OS, like, what is happening exactly? For example, if you get a so well, could you get it and run it on a, for example, uh, emulator and then... Uh... No, these devices are really, really, really custom uh, environments, really custom. Um, you cannot run that in a, in a software, uh, in, sorry, in an emulator. I mean, even a, a normal BTS consists out of something like, uh, well, old ones, probably five to ten different processes running different, you know, different architectures uh, and interfacing with each other. Um, a modern node B that is deployed right now for 3.5G networks, you have 16 DSPs, a large FPGA, PGA and about 5 power PC cores. And so you would have to simulate the entire system and all the interaction between those different devices, that's just simply not possible. So, um, I mean, if you want to see, I mean, actually see what happens on those devices, you have to get physical access to them. Um, I don't see really any, any other uh, oh. chance to do that. And uh, getting physical access to them is most likely in the lab of an operator. And it's uh, things that I, for example, do. Um, go to operators, go into their lab, um, test the equipment against uh, 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 this kind of stuff. Okay, so for example, for us, for example, it's not possible, even if you find like a, I don't know, stack overflow to exploit it somehow. It's difficult. I mean, you can sometimes you can find software images of of uh, network equipment online. It's a Chinese manufacturer called ZTE, um, and uh, they have all the software images for all their core network components on a publicly accessible FTP site. So if you know that this particular vendor is in use in a particular 
uh, you know, network, and it, and you, you and it's massive projects, right? We're not talking about you know a small firmware or something. We're talking about hundreds of megabytes of software running, running on those systems. So I can assume that, for example, even if we have the image, just getting it up and running in a single host is going to be like major work. You will not be able to get it running because you're not dealing with standard uh, system architecture on the hardware side. It's I don't think you you have a chance of, of getting this kind of stuff up in an everyday. Right. The other chance is trying to get old um, um, old network equipment. Sometimes stuff shows up on eBay. Um, you know, you can try to talk to people at operators and, and get equipment that they throw out um, and, and uh, play with that. Um, but uh, generally, the chances are low. However, there are other things you can do. I mean, you can deny service to, to subscribers uh, pretty easily from the interface. Because the message that he registers a subscriber from the network is not authenticated. So if you know somebody's identity, like the IMSI, you can send an IMSI detached message and he's gone from the network. Right? So um, there, are other, uh, there are other things on the protocol level you can do which are not exploiting the equipment. Exploiting the equipment is, well, yeah, it might not be hard technically, but it's hard to get any kind of feedback apart from whom the network is gone. Um, yeah, that's unfortunate, um, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm hoping that various, I mean, some carriers are getting more interested now in, in, in uh, you know, doing these kind of tests. And I hope that they uh, realize that uh, they should invite the hacker community to, to test this, you know, before it happens on their networks, on the real production networks. Thanks. Welcome. Okay, thanks for your attention. Um, yeah, I, I'm still around, I'm, I'm going to sit in this, uh, uh, was it hash, hash, no. Hash center. Hash what? Hash center. Hash center, yeah, the hash center. Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly sitting in the hash center. We also have the network running here. If you want to register your network, uh, sorry, register your telephone in our network, you can, uh, there's a website, gsm.hash.ch. Should be up and running now, some other people are working on this. If not, you can come to me and we can register your telephone. We also supply GPRS service and there's no filtering. So. If you ever wanted to do a port scan or some kind of attack on your telephone's IP stack without an operator network in between, we can do this, right? Um, come to us, talk to us. Okay, thanks.